Audio, thanks, great. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Matthew Chase. I'm the uh, CIO for MacPack. MacPack is a small legislative branch uh, agency um, that advises Congress uh, on Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program. Uh, we're here today to talk a little bit about what we've done with our SaaS analytics computing platform that we built on AWS. Um, let me give you just a quick little background around what MacPack is, and, and then we'll get into the uh, gory details of security and performance um, uh, and how we've used the AWS platform. So we were established uh, in late 2010. Um, I came in um, to build the uh, system from the ground up. Um, and I had the opportunity at that point in time to uh, take what was uh, soon to be the cloud first mandate in the federal government um, and take it a little step further. Um, so what MacPack's architected for our small agency um, is a cloud only platform. Um, our primary um, computing center um, is AWS. Uh, and on site, uh, all we have is uh, just a couple of uh, local services that allow us uh, to stay up in case of um, uh, a break in the uh, Amazon uh, connection. So uh, who am I? Uh, I already introduced myself, so Matthew Chase. Um, I have about 20 years experience here in um, providing both uh, private sector and public sector uh, um, companies uh, in the space. Um, so um, I got the lights, but uh, I, I do want to see kind of who's in here. Do I have any government customers in here today? Okay. Um, anybody in the healthcare industry? Okay. Quasi. Okay. Uh, cloud newbies. Anybody who's uh, in here who's just starting the cloud? One or two. Okay. Uh, any ninjas? Anybody who's experts? Okay. Did you get the wrong session? Okay. Um, another quick show of hands, just so I understand the audience. Um, who's using Amazon as their primary data computing environment? replacing their data center. Okay, yeah. So that's what MacPack is doing. Um, MacPack has replaced its on-site or a, a traditional hosted data center. Um, we run in a single primary region, uh, East 1, and we keep uh, cold recovery um, over in West 2 um, for our DR platform. Uh, we run across multiple availability zones um, for redundancy. And uh, we keep separate VPCs for air gaps um, between uh, applications uh, that we run. So uh, just to give you a, an understanding of uh, how big MacPack is, uh, for fiscal 2013, we had a $6 million appropriation. And the staff is just under 30. So this is a really small government agency. Um, but what we've built is big enterprise level computing for uh, what we have with uh, the few federal dollars uh, that, are, that are spent uh, with us. So I'm going to make the pitch that we are the perfect cloud customer. Um, and I wish there were more federal agencies that would, that would do what we're doing. So we have very predictable work cycles. We have two intense work periods uh, annually. So we owe reports to Congress on March 15th and June 15th. So from a really busy analytic period, we, you know, we spike for maybe about two out of 12 months. Um, and, and the rest of the time, um, of course, we're busy um, working reports and providing congressional assistance, um, but that's uh, important, uh, important for, for what we're doing. Um, we're still young, so we're growing with an undefined uh, future um, at MacPack. Um, and with the Affordable Care Act being implemented, um, Congress could ask us to do more um, or ask us to do less, uh, depending upon the politics involved there. Um, so we need to be flexible in what we're doing. And purchasing a large amount of uh, computing equipment um, is not cost effective, uh, especially for the US taxpayer. Um, we always have the potential for more. Um, but as a federal agency, we're extraordinarily cost conscious. We're trying to make all of our federal dollars uh, really work and go as far as they can. Um, and we had the blessing of having zero legacy infrastructure. So when I came in, I was able to build from the ground up um, exactly uh, what we're running today. So what did, what did we achieve in the cloud? Um, I estimate that we achieved greater than a 40% um, reduction in capital expenses. That's just capital expenses. Um, that doesn't cover um, electricity, utilities, labor, 
rent that we would have paid in Washington, D.C. To, to house this uh, information. And we've spread that over a typical equipment lifespan. So what we would have traditionally spent on equipment now we're in the, the typical um, Amazon uh, cost uh, expense model as opposed to capital expense. Um, we've achieved on-demand storage and archiving, uh, which is important as we start to consume more and more Medicaid data. Um, and that is just going to grow over time. Um, and because this is a startup, I've had zero over-provisioning. So I have great ideas of where I want to take the agency, but I've only had to consume it as much as I could handle um, at any one given time. Um, and we have the ability to expand and contract at will, uh, which is really, really helpful for um, us as we start to think through um, these ideas, and I'll, and I'll prove that to you here in a little bit. Um, so what's MACPAC's core focus? Um, it's providing those recommendations to Congress on the Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance. So we're kind of like a research arm for Congress in what we do. Um, and as the CIO, this, this is what I'm here to do. I'm not here to run equipment. I'm not here to uh, uh, manage and babysit electricity and cooling. Um, this AWS environment completely supports me and what um, I need to achieve. Um, so here's a, a quick sample, and, and uh, if you're interested in our work, um, feel free to go out to our website. Um, this is an example of the uh, reports that we produce. Um, and there's a, there's a gray section of pages that we produce in the middle called our MAC stats, which is the primary uh, piece that uh, Congress is really interested in. Um, it outlines and details um, statistical information on the Medicaid programs for state by state, which, of course, um, congressional leaders need in order to help evolve and, and adjust the program. So um, we do that by providing research-backed analytics. Um, we try to find the intersections of where Medicare and Medicaid uh, come out. So that's the, the duals problem that the government faces. Um, and we're evaluating Medicaid survey information um, that's out there in our analytic environment um, to help the policy uh, people uh, craft the appropriate recommendations that um, our commission votes on. So what are the tools that we're using? Um, we use SAS, Office Analytics Enterprise Platform. Uh, we run that on a Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux X64 system, and that is all running in the Amazon EC2 cloud. So what are our concerns? Um, I'm pretty sure you all have the same two. <laughs> it's always security, and it's always performance. Um, so we're going to talk real briefly about security, um, and then I'd like to dive into performance. Um, and then I'll save some time at the end for any of you who um, have questions. Uh, we, can, we can drive through those. So let's talk security. Um, what's MacPack's requirements? Um, we needed a multi-user uh, controlled environment um, in order to compute in. Um, it needed to be isolated with strong controls. Uh, what we're putting out there is reams and reams of Medicaid claims data. Um, so we have to provide the strongest controls possible around um, securing that data. Um, I wanted to make sure that we were in a situation where no sensitive data um, was ever sitting at the periphery. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard of the uh, kind of the, uh, what I would start say, the initial data breach in the government uh, where the VA had lost a laptop with lots of, uh, lots of uh, uh, records on it. Um, I wanted to make sure that MacPack was never um, in that situation. So uh, we keep all of our data um, at least a couple arms a length uh, away from our analysts um, stored securely in our, our Amazon VPC. Um, and it goes without saying this is always data uh, encrypted in transit and at rest uh, for us. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Shri uh, from 8,000 Mile Solutions. Um, he came in originally to uh, help MacPack deal with um, its security uh, situation. Um, additionally, um, 8,000 Miles also uh, provided us some guidance on um, how we ultimately um, connected uh, MacPack's uh, analytic environment. So, Shri? Thank you, Matt. Um, so, thank you all for joining. So, from a security perspective, you usually take the approach <laughs> from confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, what we're going to cover today is confidentiality, which Matt is going to get into more detail from how we handle the encryption part. Uh, the availability, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Matt had very, um, you know, stringent requirements in terms of designing a multi-AZ, multiple availability zone. 
data um, our, you know, uh, solution at the same time um, also planning for a whole region failure. Uh, we're not getting, going, getting into the details here because I'm sure you've heard uh, m you know, many other talks uh, there. One of the most um, interesting thing or creative thing that we had to do uh, from an access control perspective is this um, security groups. Uh, what we wanted was very stringent rules in terms of each server communicating with every server, controlling both inbound rules and outbound rules in such a way that there's a one-to-one -one rule. So if a server A needs to communicate with server B and needs to only have a certain port to communicate on, we, not, we need to lock down both inbound and outbound on those ports. So as you can imagine, I just gave you one example of uh, the, on the, to my left is just the Active Directory ports. There are about 20 of them. And uh, if you have 20 machines and each one is writing an inbound and outbound rule, you get 20 times 20 or 400 rules. And there is a limitation on the number of rules you can put on an EC2 instance. Uh, it is about 50 rules and uh, you can request an increase, but uh, if the, the increase really doesn't go beyond the, you know, uh, it goes up, I think you can get up to 256 rules. So what we had to do is uh, create this notion of security groups as a, as a service. So if you, Active Directory, oops, sorry. Active Directory is a service, and we tag a group for Active Directory. And if there are any client instances, like for example, we're gonna talk about a SaaS instance, you group that as a service. And then I gave another example of a DNS, you group that as a service. So instead of creating multiple rules, if I want all my client instances to be able to talk to uh, uh, a Active Directory security group, you only apply specific ports to that group of instances. So in effect, you know, from a 400 rules perspective, we are trying, we are reducing the number of instances that requires that tag. So each time I'm applying a new service, I define a group for that service, and then I figure out which instances need to access that service inbound or outbound, and then tag that group against it, right? Um, we can get into more details if you, if you have any questions on that, and that concept is, uh, is covered really well in the Microsoft, uh, deploying Microsoft applications in a secure manner. It's a t paper written by Tom Stickle from Amazon Web Services. Great. So um, thank you, Sri. Um, what we were able to achieve was a, uh, a much finer uh, grained approach to security um, in our environment um, by using uh, the rules that we're self-referencing like that. Um, I want to talk a little bit uh, about the encrypted data flow um, that we, we instituted here. So this is just a little bit of an example uh, around what we're doing with the Medicaid data um, that comes into our environment. So uh, we receive data typically from uh, HHS, CMS. Um, that data is encrypted and sent to us. Um, where we need to then decrypt it, um, apply our own keys uh, to that data, and move it to Amazon's uh, S3 service in an encrypted format. Uh, once it's in there, then we can access it within the region, um, and long-term storage um, can easily move off to Glacier um, at that point in time. But in order to get SAS to consume the data, um, we need to decrypt it. Uh, which leaves me with a uh, problem um, of keeping my data encrypted at rest. So as we decrypt the actual files, we load them onto an encrypted drive um, to, for, to handle the enterprise transform load process. Um, at that point, SAS is able to ingest that um, and then spit that out to um, encrypted SAS DB files, um, which then keep it back encrypted on disk again. Um, this is what we found um, has yielded the maximum performance without paying the overhead for um, reading off of an encrypted drive um, in, off of an EBS volume. So uh, what does this environment look like? Um, this is just a simple uh, diagram for um, how we operate at MacPack. Um, as I said, we are cloud only in most of our approach. Um, so that, uh, from our office, uh, we take an encrypted VPN hop uh, to our main VPC where our computing environment happens. Um, users are then able to access our VDI 
um, that we have there um, on an instance in our main computing area, um, able to transverse the firewalls to a separate isolated VPC, which gives us the login and compliance that we need. Um, and then that SAS, VP, SAS VPC can have much, much stronger controls uh, where it's uh, significantly isolated um, in who can access that and where that, uh, and who can load data into that space. So that's security. Um, uh, where I'm hoping to focus the rest of the time on is, is performance and what we're able to achieve. Um, and in doing that, um, it's important to understand um, the application that we're running um, as it is for any application workload uh, that's in your environment. So SaaS is an extraordinarily I.O. intensive application. Um, and when I set out to research this, by far this was my biggest concern about moving it to the Amazon cloud. Um, how am I going to deal with this I.O. Um, situation? Um, I had thought about maybe Direct Connect, maybe I'll stick a big uh, um, uh, high performance uh, drive over there, 10 gigabit connection back up to the cloud. Uh, ultimately, what I settled on, and I'll show you, is, is EBS volumes uh, within the environment. Um, but it has these huge sequential reads and writes processes. It does these transform loads and it does this analytics. So the guidance that we received from SAS that we were trying to hit is, um, they are expecting between 35 and 70 megabytes per second of I.O. throughput um, is desired. So in our example, we're dealing with a four core system. So our goal of what, what I'm going to try to show you here today is achieving the 200 meg um, uh, per second of I.O. throughput that we were looking for um, in our application. So um, our base structure, and you'll understand what I mean by base structure, um, we originally tried to figure out where we would put this, but uh, we, we settled on an M3 extra large instance running uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux X64 cluster. Um, and we chose not that we're running a clustered workload um, in this case, but um, this allowed us um, to have access to the larger uh, Amazon uh, uh, instance types that were out there. Um, in the example today, we run a one terabyte EBS RAID, um, RAID 10 for our primary environment, um, over four 500 gig drives. Uh, we run a uh, RAID 0 environment for our temp workspace. And then we also run a, a Lux uh, DM crypt environment for our ETL environment on a RAID 0. So I was trying to figure out how we would get to uh, understanding uh, this, and, and SAS had some really good guidance on using the FIO um, uh, Linux application to be able to benchmark this. Um, and so the next, cha the next challenge was, can AWS um, yield the performance? And uh, obviously I'm standing here today, so uh, I think you know what the answer is to that. Uh, but I thought of a really good metaphor um, in dealing with this. Um, for those of you who may have seen, this is Spinal Tap. <laughs> Um, I will prove to you that the Amazon dials and knobs go to 11. Um, so one better than 10. Um, so let's step through that process. So uh, what dials are we going to turn um, in the example today? Um, we're going to turn two dobs, uh, knobs. Uh, we're going to use the provision IOPS knob and we're going to use the instance knob um, to achieve the goals that uh, we're set out to do today. So uh, let's start at what we think is an acceptable uh, level for MacPack to perform daily computing environment uh, analytics uh, for small workloads uh, that our team needs to run. Uh, we'll turn the knob to three. We'll run our M3 extra large instance. We'll pull this off of a uh, four disk EBS RAID 0 stripe. Um, and let's see what we can get. So when we run the sequential read um, on this, uh, we achieve about 77 megs of throughput. Now, if you remember back, uh, what we were trying, our target was uh, to get about 200 megs of throughput. Now that's optimal, um, and definitely 77 megs of throughput when we're doing the ETL process is good, um, but it's, it's not quite where we want it to be when we have a very large um, terabyte um, Medicaid data file to, to ingest and spit out. So let's 
crank the knob right up to 10, because um, we can do that. Uh, our change here is, is we're going to turn the IOPS knob. So now what I've done is, is I've added 4,000 IOPS provision drive over the four drive stripe, uh, fundamentally achieving about 16,000 IOPS. And let's see what we get. We achieve just about what we're looking for. So uh, with just turning, turning that knob, uh, we can get about 200 megs of throughput using provisioned IOPS um, in our environment. But what do we need? If we want to push it over the cliff, you know what we do? Crank it to 11, exactly. Um, so when I crank my environment to 11, I can functionally achieve about 432 megs of throughput. So how did, how did I do that? Um, I turned the other knob. Um, in this case, um, the instance type isn't uh, particularly helpful. Uh, we're running a, a GPU for extra large there. Um, but it's the I.O. channel um, that was important here. So by just giving the disk the appropriate I.O. throughput um, from this particular instance, we were able to achieve significantly more um, than what we were hoping for um, in our environment. Um, now, I'm sure I can make the dial go higher. Um, I'm sure many of you are thinking about, well, what are the other things that, you know, you could have tried this or you could have tried that. Um, I did try to simplify this um, to make this uh, easily understandable in, in kind of the initial benchmarks that we were doing. Um, but everything that we get from our software uh, vendor from SAS um, clearly indicate that uh, the numbers that we're pulling in from sequential reads and writes using um, these particular methodologies um, definitely uh, will achieve comparable results within the application. So what are other things we could have done? Um, we could have easily done this, uh, utilized RAM in a more efficient manner and loaded some of these things into there. Um, this was done with 4K block sizes. I could have adjusted the block sizes on the disk. Um, I could have picked, well, I could have added more drives to the stripe, um, uh, effectively pushing more throughput. Um, I can tune the application. I can start to use ephemeral drives, and, and, and it goes on and on and on. The important factor here is, is that you can turn the knobs, um, and I can't do that in a traditional environment. Um, so as a small agency that only needs to turn the, the, knob, the volume knob up every now and then, and then not pay for it, this by far uh, was, was the right solution for us. Um, I did want to bring one piece of warning, and this just comes straight out of um, Amazon environment. Um, just make sure before you do uh, any of these benchmarking tests for yourself um, that you touch all the sectors in the disk. And this has to do with the, the zeroing out um, of data that's previously on the drive. So you take a huge performance hit um, if you haven't touched all the sectors um, on the drive prior to running uh, production workloads. So um, I make reference to it at the end, but there's, a, there's an EBS uh, performance um, document that, that clearly states this. So uh, make sure you do that. I think I took like, uh, it was like 25%, uh, it was like a 75% hit on performance throughput um, just by, not, touch, by run, not running the command first. Now, once you've touched the sectors, then um, it, you, get, you get full throughput, so it's not really an issue. Um, so what are some of my other messages here today? Um, you're not alone. Um, and, and when I set out to do this for our agency, um, I definitely felt that way. Um, as, as we know, this, this market space is evolving. You know, Amazon's only been doing this for seven years. Um, I stepped into this about three years ago, um, and I knew we were well ahead of the curve when we started this. Um, so reach out where you can. Um, get guidance from software vendors. Um, I've had extraordinary, extraordinarily great help from Amazon um, itself, so I have to say um, thank you to the Amazon Professional Services team, just as a sounding board, just as somebody to bounce ideas off of and understand, so, so utilize them. Um, and I, this, is, this seems extraordinarily trite, but fail quickly. Use an iterative process. Get out there, break it, do it. Um, I didn't, you know, I did most of these tests while I was sitting at home, lounging back in my bed, you know, running commands um, to get the data for this. You know, I tried different volumes, I tried different sizes, I turned the knob up and down. You can do that, and you can do it safely within this environment and only pay for what you need. And, and seek out third-party people. I mean, there's a, 
when we first started, I, I would say the, the knowledge was, uh, uh, was sparse. Um, I think people were only incrementally um, uh, smarter than we were uh, because they had read up. Uh, but we found some good people, 8,000 miles um, definitely helped us. And then get going. Uh, get out there, do, do what you want to do uh, in this environment and test it and run it. Um, so, uh, kind of getting back to, to, to what did we learn. Um, make a decision, start at zero, spend time thinking about security. And you'll hear that referenced all over the place. The portion of the model that, that, that you are responsible for as a customer, um, it, it's, it's mind boggling to me, um, you know, all the little tools and trips, especially from coming from 20 years of traditional experience and learning the new paradigm of, of cloud computing, especially in the Amazon world, um, there are things to think about. Um, security groups, the way we use self-referencing of those security groups, um, all of that was, was quintessential in us being able to secure our environment. And then crank it up. Do what you need to do. Um, I, I've been hearing this quote constantly about um, you know, fail faster, you know, fail quickly. Um, but I actually found an, a, a relatively old quote, um, which uh, I thought was really uh, applicable here. So try again, fail again, and fail better, um, I think is a, is a, is a great lesson um, in this space. So uh, some of the things uh, that, that I think are, are excellent reading um, is the Amazon EBS volume performance. Um, that, uh, that helped me understand a little bit um, about how do you use these drives and, and, and what do they mean and uh, what can you expect from them. Um, if there's one thing that I can say that Amazon does well, it's they document the hell out of things. So um, read white papers, read what they have to say, um, attend conferences like this. Um, by far, this is, this is the way to, to get to know the environment. Um, Shri referenced the uh, AWS Ma Microsoft Platform Security document, uh, which was instrumental in us helping um, come up with these um, self-referencing uh, groups uh, for security. Um, and in, in this case for us, um, just talking to our vendor, um, now SaaS has come a long way um, in its uh, support of the cloud. When we first started, um, they wouldn't even certify the application um, in the AWS cloud. Um, and now more and more people um, are using it day in and day out. Um, but these benchmarking um, documents that you, that you can find, th the, same, the same traditional models apply uh, to running the, the I.O. benchmark. Um, using file on a traditional system is no different than, than, than running it in AWS Cloud. Um, and for a laugh, you know, by all, by all means, uh, see Spinal Tap. So. Um, I want to say thank you um, to the people who were involved in this. Um, a big thank you to uh, Alex, um, my account rep, and, and the AWS team for um, providing me lots of insight and in, in understanding this. Um, it's new, it's exciting, we can do so much in it, um, but you just have to think through it uh, and work through it. Um, and Shri and the 8,000 Miles team um, was a great sounding board as, as, as I drew endless diagram after endless diagram um, on the whiteboard. Um, as I really tried to hone in on making sure that the environment was secure and the performance was there prior to, to moving uh, data out to the cloud. Um, and our vendor SaaS um, for the, the application um, was helpful. Um, I think it was a learning environment for them too that, that we could achieve these uh, types of things. So, And I, I definitely want to say thank you to, to you guys today. Um, I'll put my contact information up here, and um, if anybody in the room um, has questions, feel free to step up to Mike. I'd be happy to, to answer all kinds of questions, uh, whether they're related to this or not. Um, and feel free to reach out to me um, uh, at my uh, email address or, or check us out on our website. Please. Uh, Mike, please. Nope. There you go. Okay, great. Okay, Thanks. so a couple questions. Um, one is, what is your VDI solution that you're using? And <laughs> how much of the application is it a full desktop, or are you just surfacing some of the some of the data from SaaS? And the other question is, what's the philosophy around um, segregating your VPCs? Kind of sure. Like sure. 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 Why don't you come up so that in case we have some more questions? Um, so VDI uh, for us was was a really um, uh, 
difficult thing to deal with at the beginning. Um, luckily, we heard the brand new uh, VDI uh, unveiling today, uh, which uh, I'm excited to go and try out. Um, we're running uh, remote desktop services out there, so I'm providing a full desktop experience to our users. Um, we, have isolate, we have an isolated environment with just the tools for our SaaS analytics team versus um, some of the traditional desktop users that, that we have out there. Um, and I'm going to flip back here to show the... Uh, our architecture document. Okay, so um, the game plan here was um, I needed to make sure that that data, that this Medicaid uh, claims data, was as far away from the end user as possible. So um, in my original drawings when I started talking about this three years ago, I was drawing this thing I called the data lockbox um, up on the board. What I wanted to do at all cost was make sure that all that data was completely encrypted and that no normal user could access that data. Um, and, and Shri and his team had, had elegantly built kind of a, a VPC within the VPC um, uh, using some firewall models, but um, I felt it was hard to defend from a um, auditing and compliance standpoint. So what, what I ultimately, um, ultimately settled on was a full air gap between the two environments. Something that um, I knew I needed to pass it through a firewall. I needed to be able to log all access attempts in and out uh, of the environment. Um, so by separating into two VPCs, um, we very clearly were able to say, there's one way in and there's one way out of this environment. Um, now, uh, is, is it perfect? Um, I wish we could have VPCs and uh, I'll push this uh, Amazon uh, product team. Um, it would be nice to have VPCs that could talk um, uh, within the environment to each other. Um, uh, right now, they have to be exposed with public IPs on the outside, but we reduce the risk by um, ratcheting down the security groups on them. So only the two, only the two uh, groups will will talk to each other uh, back and forth. And what it does is it allows the um, it allows the um, IT team to then securely take the data that we get in, make sure that it has our keys applied to it, and then make sure that it's decrypted onto the appropriate and volumes prior to the analytics team uh, being able to ingest it into SaaS. So we kind of do all the pre-staging and make sure that the security um, is where we want it. Um, so when the data is unencrypted, uh, it's still encrypted. Just, uh, just to add, a, add to that, VPC peering, as, um, in, as Matt said, and then also S3 is a internet-based service. Um, so to not have to access the internet if you don't have to um, is uh, by isolating the SaaS VPC to, to be able to access the S3 separately is, a, is an additional control also that you gain. Um, again, I think from Amazon request perspective, it'll be VPC peering and VPC gateway to S3. Would be a good uh, addition. Any other questions? Anybody working on building their own systems? Yeah, not working on building my own, but uh, just a little bit more in depth as far as your architecture goes. Sure. From the uh, be between EBC and the uh, actual SaaS instance. Mm -hmm. You said that there's, yeah, you said that there's, um, I guess, uh, encrypted line all the way into your SaaS architecture and your SaaS application. Um, how are you guys controlling that process? Or could you go a little, a little bit more in depth into how you guys are uh, controlling the process for that particular uh, motion into that VPC? So um, getting it into the VPC is actually um, an interesting uh, point for uh, having Amazon regions. So um, by moving it into the S3 bucket as an encrypted file, um, it's accessible to all the VPCs who can, who can pull it down. So um, as, long as, they can, as long as they can access that, that link, um, then we can pull it down. So Right, so um, we move the encrypted file around all day long. 
Um, and then uh, it's up to IT's job who holds the keys to then decrypt it um, onto that drive, which we hold the keys to. <laughs> um, at that point in time, and only that time, um, is the data at a, at a place where the, where the analyst can actually pick it up, see it in the application, and then perform it. But then it's on their responsibility, if they're writing files out or SAS DB files out, that they need to put the appropriate encryption back on the file uh, when they do it. So a lot of times the ETL process for loading it in will strip and transform data appropriately. So um, they may link on a PII data field, but then what we get back out when they go to perform the analytics is, is, a, is a clean file. So um, that storage can remain unencrypted and then they can use the native, native uh, uh, FIPS encryption that's built into to SAS to, to keep the files secure. Don't be shy. I'll answer all kinds of questions. Uh, how are we doing on time? What time is it? Okay. We were really, really. Oh, there's a question there. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Have they elevated their questions? To, now that you have this capacity to very quickly analyze things, do they understand the capacity of your services to provide them answers? Are they, or, or are they still kind of grappling with the potential of what they could do? Okay, so uh, uh, definitely more an operational question that I would uh, normally pass on to my executive director, but. Um, I'll take a, take a whack at it. Um, Congress expects us to do these types of things regardless. Um, I, think, uh, I, I think the volume and the questions that they're asking are consistent with how they've, they've continually asked them. Um, what this means for our agency is, is that we don't have to go rely upon contractors as much. So um, traditionally they would ask these questions and the first thing we would go do is need to let a contract out to, to do this. So part of, part of what our goal was when we established the agency was building in-house capabilities for data analytics. Um, and where that was small at first, SAS on the desktop, uh, running small file, running partial files or proving ideas, um, it's grown now into a more enterprise environment. So uh, what what this yields for us is <clears throat> it's really important that when we're talking to Congress and when we're making recommendations to them um, that there is real substance behind what it is. It's not just how the commission would like to evolve the program, but it's rooted in true data analytics um, that says here's how we think the programs can, can change and be affected by this. Um, and the more consistent we are, and the more uh, transparent we are, the more capable we are as, a, as an organization, um, helps breed confidence. Um, we're a nonpartisan agency, so it's really important for both R's and D's and independents that, that what we're having is rooted in that. Um, and I think what this, what this environment does, especially with the Affordable Care Act and, and lots more questions I expect coming down the pipe, um, is just solidify the agency's ability to, to continue to evolve those. And as we still and will always do uh, let contracts for very complex related things, um, this allows us to kind of take that back in and run the, the, the types of things that Congress is looking for. So um, I, I really meant to pack a uh, Mac pack report and just wave it around in the air, but um, the whole central section of what it is and, and, and the, fact, the, the value add that we provide to, to Congress right now is you know, a senator from Nebraska or wherever being able to look at how their state compares against the 50 states. Um, and that data, although it was out there, wasn't being compiled, uh, wasn't, wasn't being displayed in a, in a, in a manner. So um, that's, that's kind of how we have. But as far as volume goes, um, I don't expect them to ask um, any more new questions than they would have before based upon the architecture. Um, but what this does is provide us a cost efficient way. So if tomorrow they say, listen, we, we're going to give you more money, we want you to do more things. Um, it's just a matter of us turning the knobs appropriately and, and putting the staff in play um, to do that. But, you know, for the 10 months a year that we're not running big analytic files, we can shrink the environment down. Um, we're going to provide the analysts a stop and start button at the end of the day. 
So when we push it off, it's off, and uh, you know we're paying for storage. But you know, for the big files um, in Glacier, it's you know nickels as opposed to um, hard money, which I would have. Um, when I walked in the door, I had a very clear traditional IT picture of what this was going to be. Um, and that was, you know, a big NetApp array, redundant disk, um, lots of HP servers. And then I said, oh, I've got to manage this thing. <laughs> and this is an agency of under 30 people at the moment, right? So the things that, that I'm doing, you know, as a CIO, I got to put on my Unix hat, I got to put on my security hat, I got another guy who's helping do some of this stuff, and I have to rely upon smart vendors to be able to help me pull through some of the stuff, even though I may know these things. I, I, I mean, I need manpower to do this. Um, but I was going to provision all of this stuff, and I didn't necessarily know the questions. So um, what I get now is just building it on consumption. Another question? Yeah, so I was wondering if you, um, if you look at other packages other than SaaS, such as uh, even Amazon ZMR, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at all into that, and what, what, made you, what made your team choose SaaS as opposed to another package? Sure. Um, and uh, I think this would be a typical question, and you'll get a typical answer. Um, it's the knowledge of the people um, who, uh, the resources that we're going to find in this environment. So um, analytic programmers in the government are going to be SaaS-based mostly. Uh, we do have Stata on site, um, but I am really intrigued at using EMR or other open source tools. I mean, I, I think there's a ton of things. You know, I was even talking to Splunk the other day because we have a really nice Splunk implementation um, that we built multiple availability zones in the cloud for ingesting all of the log data that we need for compliance. Um, but they're like, can you, can you give us access to the Medicaid data? We'd love to splunk the data and, and, and run it through the, because they're basically, it's a Hadoop, it's, it's EMR in their platform. So um, I, I think there's a lot of questions. I mean, I think there's, you know, we heard the, heard the conversation earlier for the, um, uh, during the keynote of, you know, this is a, this is a blinders thing, right? You know, there's, there's certain people and, and, and you're going down a particular path um, I think as you start to get more and more new people who are out there are using new tools, EMR, other things that are out there, um, I expect that, you know, we can evolve and, and do this. And SaaS is not a cheap application, right? Um, and, we, and we went one further. We put enterprise SaaS in, which has yet an even higher price tag. And most people don't do that. But part of what we need to do is back to this question of reliability of data. Rather than have five or ten programmers um, out there doing things five or ten different ways with five or ten different variables. When we look at Medicaid data, it's really important how you, how you process the, um, the populations out there. So if you're going to say somebody's disabled, for instance, what, what does that mean? How do, you, how, do you, how do you cut the data to that variable? Um, and moving to an enterprise SaaS platform allowed us a lot more controls around that. So we could more centrally define variables. I can centrally manage security issues. Um, so I think from a, like a developed application, enterprise application, um, I definitely think it, it was a good choice based upon the resources were out there. But yeah, it would be great to do it with IAM users and, and uh, Elastic MapReduce um, and figure that out. But that talent set isn't there yet. So I think that's, I think that's the reason. So. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So, uh, so I am a member of the Small Agency CIO Council, um, uh, but I have the distinction of being in the legislative branch um, as opposed to the executive branch, uh, which is where all the data center consolidation um, mandates from the president are coming down at. Um, so uh, my executive branch counterparts, I expect, <laughs> um, would die to be in my shoes at the moment. Um, I didn't have to move anything. Um, I was able to, from day one, walk in the door and, and pick a platform. Now, I looked at a variety of, of, of tools. Um, out the door, I looked at Terramark. I looked at um, a lot of different cloud providers. Um, and at the end of the day, Amazon walked into my office and said, 
I, we can do it all. Because, because Amazon was a part of my play from early on. Oh, it's going to be dev and test and storage and the simple things that all of us would go after. Um, and eventually it became the whole picture for me. Um, but yeah, from data center consolidation standpoints, um, the, the, the rule sets that are out there from a FISMA perspective, from a HIPAA perspective, um, from what the executive branch compliance uh, is requiring, as well, as well as the contract vehicles and stuff that are out there, um, they're getting there quickly. And I think FedRAMP is a huge, huge push forward um, in the federal government being able to adopt those things. Um, as a small agency, I, there's, there's no way that I could go through and conduct and tell Amazon, okay, you need to give me all of your, your compliance documents and I'm going to run those through. I, I mean, I would have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars just trying to vet the environment. Um, so uh, I had to rely upon other people's authority to operate um, in, the, in the space um, and take a look and, and take the um, uh, comfort in what was there. And now that FedRAMP's there, it's just kind of the rubber stamp that says federal agencies it's still not an authority to operate, but all the baseline controls that we expect from a NIST perspective are in play here. Um, they are doing their job as, a, uh, as, a, as an appropriate um, uh, cloud provider. So um, I think that's, that's going to facilitate that. But um, I, haven't, I haven't specifically gone out and talked to uh, other executive agencies on this. But. So I, I think all that FedRAMP does for, for me as, a, as an Amazon adopter is just confirm the belief that the security controls are in place. Um, as far as my relationship with, with HHS, um, the data flow is still the same. Um, it typically comes on a drive in an encrypted AES-256 format that meets the appropriate standards and is couriered uh, appropriately and signed off when it's received and all the normal um, snail mail stuff that, that we would do. Um, there isn't a data pipe between us or anything like that. Um, and, you know, and some of this comes from separation of, uh, separation of branches. So, um, you know, there's a certain amount of, uh, you know, separation that needs to be there in order to, to be working. But um, I'll, I, I, for me, it, it just gives me comfort in knowing. I mean, uh, I will make the, the case time and time again and talk to any audience that I am, as a, as a small federal agency, I am so much better off being in the cloud from a security perspective. There is no way I could leverage these controls as a small agency. It just wouldn't happen. And agencies that would that potentially try to do that are at a complete disadvantage. Um, you know, I'll make the statement that as a as a small federal agency, you probably have no business running a data center. As a micro agency like me, absolutely not. Right? Because you can't you can't get the controls right. You can't, you can't secure it, and, and anything that was in my building, so the tenant rule of my architecture for everything that I build from the beginning up is nothing can live in my office that does not have a parent or a big brother or a big sister sitting in the cloud. So tomorrow, if a water leak is in my building or it's asbestos or the building gets blown up or there's a fire, we go to Starbucks and we run, right? You know, I can reconstitute anywhere knowing that from day one when I make these decisions, whether it's SaaS stuff, Google for government that we run, or it's our infrastructure as a service at Amazon, that the appropriate controls are in place, they're cloud-based, it supports my work at home efforts, it supports my DR efforts in every time that, that we run forward. So um, I, I, I would say that uh, from a security perspective, I am far better off um, in being in a, in a cloud environment where I have all of these eyes um, at, looking out for me than, than trying to produce these controls myself. So. Well, it's the end of the day. Um, thank you so much. Um, if you guys have any other questions, um, feel free to email me or come chat with me after this, but thank you so much. Um, let me move to the end slide here. Um, please, if uh, you found this valuable, um, fill out the um, uh, Amazon uh, uh, surveys.
um, so that uh, they can get feedback on uh, what was done. Um, thank you again, Trish. Thank you.